Hey everyone, and for those that don't know me, my name's Hadley England and I'm a marine scientist from Sydney, Australia. I've been keeping aquariums for over 10 years now and I often get asked a lot of questions about how hard is it to keep a marine tank? So I thought I'd put together a little video sort of explaining all the different things that you guys need to know before you dive into the hobby. Things such as what maintenance, what are the costs, what happens if I go away, what sort of things can go wrong with these aquariums. So sit back and I'll take you guys through some of the things that I've learned over the years. So when you're first thinking about starting a marine aquarium, you need to ask yourself, what sort of tank am I wanting? There are several different options out there and depending on what option you choose, often they can be a lot cheaper and a lot easier to keep. Options such as fish only tanks are actually not that much harder to keep than freshwater tanks. However, if you want SPS dominated tanks like this one here, it can be a lot trickier. Okay, so you're considering keeping a marine tank. The first thing I would ask myself is, am I willing to put in the effort it takes? You can have all the money in the world and the greatest setup and all the corals, but if you don't put in the time and effort to look after these systems properly, then you'll never succeed. You have to remember as well that even though these are just corals and fish, we still have an obligation to look after them and we are still required to try and give them the best lives possible in our system. So once you've decided you wanna get into this hobby, the first thing you need to do is ask yourself, what tank do I want? There are so many different tanks out there. You can buy one straight off the showroom floor or you can design one yourself like I have here. There are several pros and cons with each of these. Like with this system here that I built, I was able to put in everything that I wanted into the system. However, if you buy one directly from a retailer, often it has everything that you already need and you know that it's also not gonna break. Generally, I recommend a tank size anywhere from about 100 up to 250 or 300 liters. Having a tank that's kind of a medium size like that is actually a lot easier to keep. You have to remember that with smaller tanks, whilst it can be easier to change and manipulate parameters, because the volume is so much smaller, those parameters are prone to change so much more quickly as well. So having that little bit of extra water volume can actually help to ensure that your marine tank is a lot more stable and that things don't fluctuate as much or as quickly over time. Secondly, when people go to set up a tank, they often wanna pick out all the expensive gear, they want this and that and that. What I recommend is just start with the basics. You don't wanna be one of those people that has all the gear and no idea. When I first started, I couldn't afford lots of this fancy stuff. I had cheap lights, I had cheap heaters and a cheap skimmer, and I had great success with them. But at the same time, I also put in a lot of time and effort to learn about these systems which I'm trying to recreate. So even though I recommend to people not to go all out on all the equipment, if you are going to get any equipment, I recommend getting good quality stuff. That way, as the tank grows and matures over time, you don't actually need to upgrade your equipment. You can just get more of that same piece. So say with the lights, if you get two good quality lights, and over time, as the corals start to grow out, you can just add to those lights rather than having to get rid of those and get a whole new system. So generally, when you first start up a tank, I would recommend getting a good set of lights you want an RODI top up. This basically means it will automatically keep the salt levels in the aquarium at an optimal level by replacing the water that is lost due to evaporation. You also will want a good heater. Something like a titanium heater with an external thermostat will be great. You can get glass heaters and they, some of them are pretty good these days, but they are prone to breaking and the titanium ones will last a lot longer. Next, you want some good wave makers. No matter what you're keeping in your tank, you need good flow in your tank. First of all, if you're keeping corals, they require a lot of flow backwards and forwards to help exchange nutrients and oxygen and carbon dioxide within the water column. And even if you're keeping fish in the tank, you need good flow to help keep all the waste up off the bottom of the ground and then take it back through the filter where it can be filtered out. And that leads me onto the next piece of equipment, which is a filter. You wanna have a good filter system in these tanks. I see a lot of people trying to set up saltwater tanks using freshwater equipment. And whilst it can be done, Generally, it doesn't work out too well, especially as the bio load in the tank gets more and more. So generally, I recommend when you're going to buy a tank to get one that has a sump system in it. And that way you can also put all your other equipment in it as well. 
The other piece of equipment that you'll want is a protein skimmer. It doesn't have to be the best one out on the market, but I will try and avoid the cheap ones. And whilst a cheap one will work, it just won't work as efficiently as sort of your middle or upper spec brand. And these protein skimmers are not only important for removing a lot of the waste that's in the system, but they also form a really important part in keeping a lot of the oxygen in the tanks, especially at night, as these are living organisms, and at night they respire CO2 into the system. So this not only drops the oxygen level in the tank, but also decreases the pH which can be quite toxic and dangerous to a lot of the inhabitants in there. All up for a total cost for setting up this tank not including any livestock or sand or salt or anything like that I generally say that you're probably looking around that $1,500 to $2,000 Australian mark. Obviously it will probably depend on what country you're in and what shops you have around you but I would always try and make sure you have a healthy budget when you're first setting up this tank otherwise it will cost you a lot more in the long run. So once you've got the tank and it's filled up with water, I generally recommend to add a thin layer of sand to the bottom, often around one and a half to two centimeters deep. You can always add to it later on, but this sand will also form an important part in holding a lot of that bacterial diversity which you need in these tanks. In terms of the aquascapes in these tanks, it can be quite easy to get carried away by trying to create this beautiful looking aquascape with all these little caves and points and everything like that. And whilst it will look good initially, you have to remember that the aim of these tanks is to have the corals grow out as much as possible. So in a perfect tank, if your tank is, really, is going really well and looking really healthy, you're not even gonna see that aquascape. So by all means, have a think about it. Think about what corals you wanna get, how they're gonna grow, and think about what you want the aquascape to look like in three or four years down the track, not immediately several months after you put it in. I get a lot of questions about what this aquascape looked like when I put it in. And to be honest, I didn't put a lot of thought into it at all. Basically, I just glued a whole lot of rocks together, stuck them in the tank, but then I put a lot of effort into deciding where, what corals go where and how they grow and stuff like that. Once it comes to adding livestock to these tanks, I generally recommend starting with a few easy to keep fish. These fish can be anything from damsels to clownfish or something like that. I would avoid the more aggressive types of fish, so things like your tangs. You generally want to try and add them in later as they can be quite territorial. And if you put them in the tank first when there's nothing else in there, they'll likely try and kill anything else you put in there after it. And when you're first adding these fish, I recommend not to add too many either. In a tank this size, what I would do is maybe add four or five little chromis within the first one to two months and then leave it at that for a while and let the bacterial diversity in the tank start to build up before you put any more in. In terms of coral, same thing, I would pick some of the more hardier species. So I generally start with more of your soft corals, so things like sacrophytons, morphs, even anemones can sometimes be a lot easier. But like I said before, have a think about what you want this tank to look like in three to four years time and try and pick corals that fit into that plan. I also get a lot of questions about maintenance on these tanks. I often get asked, how do you make your tank look so clear? How often are you doing water changes? What do you do to these tanks to look after them? And look, it really varies. It depends on what you want to get out of these tanks. I used to have all these clients that I used to look after the tanks and I would go there once a month and that would be the only time anything's ever done on these tanks. However, they did have a lot of equipment. They had expensive auto water changes and their tanks could have looked a lot better if they put the effort into it. So ultimately these tanks can be as easy or as difficult as you want them to be, but at the end of the day, you are only gonna get out of them what you put into them. On this tank, for example, it varies how much time I spend on it each day. If I was to put an average on it, I would say maybe 20 to 30 minutes a day. Obviously there are times when I go away and I, there's a period of one or two weeks where I don't do anything to it. But in saying that, I also have a lot of automation on these tanks. So I have things like doses, which dose in all the major and trace elements which get depleted as the corals take them down. I also have automatic water top off so that RODI system I was talking about before, that automatically tops up all the fresh water that is taken out due to evaporation. I have an automatic heater and chiller. So this basically keeps the water temperature at a stable level throughout winter and summer. And I also have an automatic filter roller. So this is almost like a filter sock, but it's on a big roller. It looks like a big piece of toilet paper. And as the water level rises in the filter, it automatically rolls the filter roller. The water level goes back. And as the water comes down through the filter, 
it goes through that paper and all the detritus and all the waste products are filtered out. Apart from that, I probably do one water change a week, if that. Sometimes I don't do them for a whole month. It really depends on how the corals are looking and how the water chemistry is in these tanks. Oftentimes, the nutrients in this tank are really quite low, so there's actually no need for me to do a water change. Sometimes I just like to do it because it's a good habit to be in, especially if your tank does generally rely on water changes. But when I do do a water change, it's generally only about 20 litres. So this is a 300 litre system. So that's only about five to 10%. So it's really not much of a water change. So this might sound a bit weird, but the other piece of maintenance I do in these tanks is actually feeding. A lot of people don't really realize that feeding is actually maintenance on these tanks. In tanks like this, you have loads of different bacteria which perform different tasks within the tank. The microbiome of this tank is almost just as important as the maintenance I do on it. But in order to keep that microbiome healthy and happy, you have to have a constant input of nutrients into it. So when I feed the tanks, I try and feed them the exact same amount, the exact same thing every day to try and keep that steady baseline. Occasionally I'll mix up the food and give the fish sort of different pellets or something like that but generally I try and give them a varied diet so the same varied diet every single day that way there's no spikes or drops in nutrients. If you get a massive spike in nutrients it can cause all the bacteria and all the algae in the tank to bloom up and it will overtake the tank or if you don't feed the tank for several days a lot of that bacteria and algae can die because it's starved and then that causes a whole range of different issues. So the main thing with these tanks is to just be consistent with whatever you do. The tank will fall into its natural cycle, but if you keep trying to chop and change what you're doing to the tank, you're not gonna give it a chance to fall into that cycle. Another really common question I get is how often should you be testing the water in your tank? And I'll be honest, I actually don't test the water a lot in this one now, but when I first started the tank, I was testing it multiple times a week. That is because when you first set up a tank, it is in its most vulnerable stage. One of the most important components of water chemistry in these is calcium, alkalinity, and magnesium. When you first set up a tank, often the rock work can leach in different things, or if you suddenly put corals in the tank, it can be suddenly taking out all this alkalinity, calcium, magnesium. Therefore, it's really important to be on top of the demands of these tanks early on. So when you first set up a tank, I generally recommend you test everything. So that is alkalinity, calcium, magnesium, nitrate, phosphate. And if the tank is really new, and I'm talking about within the first month, I would test ammonia as well. It's also important to remember that whilst you're testing these tanks, you shouldn't act on things straight away. So what you wanna do is you actually wanna test all your water parameters and see how they change over time. I often get messages from new reefers asking, what should I keep my calcium at? What should I keep my alkalinity at? And generally what I say is aim for natural levels. And natural levels are quite variable, which is good because there's no specific target which you should be aiming for. Your tank will settle into its natural rhythm. So what I recommend to do is as you're testing all these parameters, record them down and track how they go over time and you should start to see a trend happening. If the trend is your alkalinity is going up and up and up, you might need to add more corals or you might need to make some other changes to the tank or if your alkalinity is going down, 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 that's when you might want to start dosing alkalinity and get an automatic doser. What I don't like seeing is when people try and target very specific values. So say if your tank is testing at 430 calcium but you want 440 calcium and you're trying to dose that last little 10 ppm of calcium, don't do it. It is a waste. Let your tank settle into its natural rhythm. Obviously, if your calcium is super low, like 300, you know, of course you need to bring it up. But don't chase numbers. You need to aim for a range. And if your tank is testing within that range, happy days. And if it falls below, try and figure out why it is happening and try and correct it slowly over time, not by just dumping a whole bottle of calcium into it because that's only gonna cause more issues. Going back to feeding. So as I was saying before, I like to feed the same thing consistently day in, day out. However, even though I'm feeding the same thing, I am still feeding a varied diet. So that includes high quality frozen food. 
I try and avoid feeding too much processed food. So processed foods such as flakes and pellets and stuff like that, often they can have a lot of really good nutritious stuff in them, but they are also packed with phosphates. And if you are feeding these constantly, it's only gonna bring up the phosphate levels in your tank. I really like frozen food because it is a natural food that is naturally occurring. It's things that these fish actually just naturally eat in the environment as well. And it has all the nutrients in the correct ratio. So there's this ratio called the Redfield ratio. And basically it's a ratio of the correct amount of carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus. However, when we try and feed these ultra processed foods, often these ratios are out of balance and then that's when it can cause issues in your tanks. If you have too much phosphorus, it can cause all this algae to grow and your corals really don't like it either. I also try and avoid feeding nori. I feel like nori has a lot of phosphate in it as well. And if you have algae in your tanks, your tanks don't really need it. Moving on to the next part. So this is a question I get a lot is, what happens when I go away? As a marine scientist, often I need to go away for long extended periods for work, so like two to three weeks at a time. As I was saying before, I have a lot of automation on these tanks, and I'm lucky enough that a lot of the time my wife will stay here as well so she can help out. However, in saying that, I still try and make it as easy as possible for her to look after these tanks. I have things like automatic fish feeders on the tank. I also have on that tank over there, I have an automatic water tester. This is really good because it actually means I can log into my phone whilst I'm away and check the parameters of the tank. Ultimately, if you're just starting out, you're not gonna have access to these systems and that's okay because often I find the more complicated you make these tanks, the harder it is to actually maintain. If you keep these tanks nice and simple so that friends can drop in and change the water or feed the tank or do something like that, if you do that and keep your system nice and stable, then there will be no issues when you're away. If you keep that consistency, then you can go away on a holiday and have friends come over and do what they need to these tanks. Another thing that I've done to these tanks, which I find really helps, especially when both myself and my wife are away, is I've actually installed security cameras on the tanks. This is just a really quick and easy way for me to check the health of everything in the tank. Whilst it doesn't give you things like temperature or salinity or pH or anything like that, I can tell that if my corals are happy, then the water conditions are good. So if I'm over overseas somewhere and I can look on my camera and I can see oh, all the polyps are out, all the fish are happy, then I know that that tank's going well. However, if I look on it and see that something's out of check or the water level's dropped or something like that, I know that something's gone wrong and I can ask someone to come over and check it out for me. So there are really good ways that you can keep these tanks and still go on holidays at the same time. So another important part of keeping marine tanks, and I can't stress this enough, is that you need to put in the time and effort to learn about these systems. You're never gonna get anywhere in this hobby if you don't learn about why things are behaving the way they're behaving. Especially with corals, there's so many different things which can affect their health, and if you don't know about these things, then you're never gonna be able to keep a stable marine system. Thankfully, there are a whole range of online groups which basically dedicated to answering these questions. I myself have relied on quite a few of these groups and they are filled with so many knowledgeable people. And people just like yourself who might be starting out or people who have been in the hobby for 20, 30 years. So there are always people that are willing to help out. However, you have to be able to also help yourself. You can't just rely on people to tell you what to do or what's this or what's that. You have to be a researcher yourself. You have to figure out why is my fish behaving like this? Why is it sick? Or why is my coral closed up? It could be anything from maybe my light's not giving enough light. Maybe my alkalinity is too low or maybe my salinity is off. But you need to learn about these things so that you can ensure that the tank is as healthy as possible. So at the end of the day, whilst it can be quite tricky and a really expensive hobby, it is so rewarding and there is nothing better than having other people come into your house and just look with utter amazement at these systems which you have created. So thanks everyone for watching and I hope that this video has helped you decide for yourself whether or not you want to keep a marine tank. Hopefully it has. Um, I've really enjoyed keeping tanks and I will continue to enjoy keeping tanks for well into the future.